Amazon's second headquarters may create jobs, but it will also drive inequality and housing crises. Amazon's HQ2 may come with a social sacrifice. Major cities the world over are in a tough position. A trend of increased income inequality has created bifurcated cities characterized by intractable housing crises and gentrification. The matching political trend has been for local politicians to try to attract new industries with the goal of using that prosperity to bridge the growing divide or so they say. Amazon's recent announcement that it's looking to build a second headquarters which it calls HQ2 to rival its sprawling footprint in Seattle plays right into the hands of these mayors who are hoping to boost their city's economic growth. Yet by trying to attract a company like Amazon, they're not taking into account the good chance that the problems faced by their cities will only multiply. In its request for proposal, Amazon lists a number of demands for cities looking to host its HQ2, including a population of more than 1 million, a development-ready urban location, on-site connections to mass transit and proximity to major highways and an international airport. However, there is another very important requirement that will trump the others in the end. Despite the fact that Amazon is the fourth largest company in the world by market cap, its choice of where it locates its offices and warehouses depends largely on the incentives that states and municipalities are willing to dish it and the competition for HQ2 will be no different. Mega deals in recent years have granted massive tech firms an average of 658,000 per job created. And there are serious questions about whether these large subsidies are justified. Why is it that Amazon, Google, Apple and other big tech firms so doggedly pursue tax breaks and subsidies when they're already some of the largest companies in the world, often with plenty of money in the bank? It's not like they really need it, though their desire to reduce their overall tax burden seems to fall more in the realm of ideology than necessity, as illustrated by the convoluted tax evasion schemes they help pioneer. And it's not even that they already have plenty of money. Governments on all levels need to consider the kind of incentives they're creating by giving so much to companies that are increasingly and rightfully perceived to be quasi-monopolies and may find themselves in the crosshairs of antitrust regulators under a future democratic administration in the US and possibly much sooner in Europe. Does it make sense to subsidize the growth of such large firms when small businesses increasingly struggle to survive in an economy with such high levels of consolidation? One only needs to look at the cities in which these massive tech companies are currently headquartered to see the effects they've had on the urban environment and they're not positive. Any mayor looking to win Amazon's HQ2 really needs to consider the serious social implications that will come with it, but their statements suggest that they're focused only on winning the prize and that doesn't bode well. Crises in the tech heartlands. All major cities are experiencing a series of issues related to affordability, displacement and inequality, but these crises are most acute in the cities that have become hubs for the tech industry. There's little reason to believe that the same won't also happen in whichever city Amazon gets the biggest tax break in exchange for building HQ2. San Francisco has become the poster child not only for this wave of technological development but also for the housing crises that are sweeping major cities. The city boasts the highest median income in the country, at 96,677, thanks to the high wages of those who work at the major tech companies. Yet that doesn't mean that everyone's doing great simply because incomes are higher. Those incomes are necessary because the prices in the Bay Area have climbed to outrageous levels. The average house costs 1.25 million and astronomical housing prices are pushing out not only service workers and teachers who can no longer afford to live in the city, but also some of the tech workers who are earning those high salaries and are struggling to get by. And that's all without the presence of Amazon, which hires more workers than most tech companies, and thus takes up a lot more space. In Seattle, Amazon occupies 8.1 million square feet of office space across 33 buildings, taking up almost 20% of the city's prime office space, and it expects to cover more than 12 million square feet in more than 40 buildings by 2022. Its footprint has brought a lot of talented people to Seattle, but like in San Francisco, that has also meant a shortage of housing and skyrocketing prices. Even though Seattle's median income is approaching 80,000, it has the largest homeless population of any major American city. Its housing market is the hottest in the country, with prices rising faster than anywhere else, and despite another 9,000 apartments being put on the market, 
Rent increases continue to outpace those in most other metro areas. And it's not just housing thoughts experiencing steep increases Amazon's endless pursuit of office space, even though it already uses more than the next 43 companies combined, is causing those prices to soar as well. In many ways, Seattle is following close behind San Francisco thanks to tech's growing presence in the city. All the major cities across North America that are presumed to be in serious consideration for HQ2 are already experiencing high levels of inequality and unaffordable housing costs, but whichever Amazon chooses will see those problems become more acute. Incentives aside, that will be the true human cost of attracting Amazon. Mayors looking to bid for Amazon's HQ2 need to think long and hard about the kind of city they're trying to create. Amazon's presence will benefit some skilled workers. But it will make many more worse off as HQ2 places strong upward pressure on housing prices, rents and even office space for other businesses trying to establish themselves. And as Amazon widens the divide and worsens the social crisis, it will be paying less tax toward abating them than other businesses due to its demands for subsidies and tax rebates. Attracting Amazon will come with a social sacrifice, and mayors need to put more thought into whether they're ready to make it. Thank you for watching. For the follow-up, subscribe to the channel yourself here. Pay sales tax, which is not true, and so hurts other retailers. Part of a pattern by the former businessman and reality television host of periodically turning his ire on big American companies since he took office in January. Daniel Ives, a research analyst at GBH Insights, said Trump's comment could be taken as a warning to the retail giant. However, he said he was not concerned for Amazon. We do not see any price hikes in the future. However, that is a risk that it Amazon is clearly aware of and it is building out its distribution system aggressively, he said. Amazon has shown interest in the past in shifting into its own delivery service, including testing drones for deliveries. In 2015, the company spent $11.5 billion on shipping, 46% of its total operating expenses that year. Amazon shares were down 0.86% to 1,175.90 by early afternoon. Overall, U.S. stock prices were down slightly on Friday. Millions of parcels. Satish Gindal, president of Ship Matrix Incorporated, which analyzes shipping data, disputed the idea that the Postal Service charges less than United Parcel Service Incorporated UPSN and FedEx Corp FDXN the other biggest players in the parcel delivery business in the United States. Many customers get lower rates from UPS and FedEx than they would get from the post office for comparable services, he said. The postal service delivers about 62% of Amazon packages, for about 3.5 to 4 million a day during the current peak year and holiday shipping season, Jindal said. The Seattle-based company and the post office have an agreement in which mail carriers take Amazon packages on the last leg of their journeys, from post offices to customers' doorsteps. Amazon's no. 2 carrier is UPS, at 21%, and FedEx is third, with 8% or so, according to Jindal. Trump's comment tapped into a debate over whether postal service pricing has kept pace with the rise of e-commerce which has flooded the mail with small packages private companies like UPS have long claimed the current system unfairly undercuts their business. Steve Gott, a spokesman for UPS, noted that the company values its productive relationship with the Postal Service, but that it has filed with the Postal Regulatory Commission its concerns about the Postal Service's methods for covering costs. Representatives for Amazon, the White House, the U.S. Postal Service and FedEx declined comment or were not immediately available for comment on Trump's tweet. According to its annual report, the Postal Service lost $2.74 billion this year, and its deficit has ballooned to $61.86 billion. While the Postal Service's revenue for first-class mail, marketing mail and periodicals is flat or declining, revenue from package delivery is up 44 percent since 2014 to 19.5 billion inches the fiscal year ended september 30 2017 but it also lost about 2 billion inches revenue when a temporary surcharge expired in april 2016 according to a government accountability office report in february the service is facing growing personnel expenses particularly 73.4 billion inches unfunded pension and benefits liabilities.
The Postal Service has not announced any plans to cut costs. By law, the Postal Service has to set prices for package delivery to cover the costs attributable to that service. But the Postal Service allocates only 5.5% of its total cost to its business of shipping packages even though that line of business is 28% of its total revenue. Addition Trump targets Amazon in call for postal service to hike prices. U.S. President Donald Trump on Friday targeted online retailer Amazon in a call for the country's postal service to raise prices of shipments in order to recoup costs. U.S. President Donald Trump on Friday targeted online retailer Amazon in a call for the country's postal service to raise prices of shipments in order to recoup costs. Why is the United States Post Office, which is losing many billions of dollars a year, while charging Amazon and others so little to deliver their packages, making Amazon richer and the post office dumber and poorer? Should be charging much more. Trump wrote in a post on Twitter. Thank you for watching. For the follow up, subscribe to the channel yourself here. In the interview that there had been any collusion with Russia. U.S. intelligence agencies believe Moscow tried to tip the presidential election in favor of Mr. Trump, a charge denied by both Russia and the U.S. president. Mr. Trump has labeled Mr. Mueller's investigation a witch hunt while other Republicans accuse it of bias. Mr. Trump repeated his allegation that Democrats had invented the issue as a hoax, as a ruse, as an excuse for losing an election. The president said he was not concerned about when the inquiry would finish as he had nothing to hide. But he said it makes the country look very bad, and it puts the country in a very bad position. So the sooner it's worked out, the better it is for the country. He was repeating his comments from May that the probe was hurting the US terribly. Mr. Trump said the matter had angered his supporters, adding, my base is stronger than it's ever been. On other areas in the interview, Mr. Trump. Again condemned Democrats for not taking a bipartisan approach to legislation said he had to endorse the defeated candidate Roy Moore in the Alabama special election, as that was what the head of the Republican Party had to do. Again criticized Attorney General Jeff Sessions for accusing himself from the Russian inquiry. Said he believed the media would become more favorable to him as their ratings would go down the tubes if he were not in office. Thank you for watching. For the follow-up, subscribe to the channel yourself here. 50,000 years ago when he worked at the president's New Jersey golf club and was trying to make the PGA Tour, Mr. Trump asked him how much he made playing on the professional circuit. It's like three million, Mr. Herman said. Which to him is like making a billion, because he doesn't spend anything, Mr. Trump joked. Ain't that a great story? In the interview, the president touted the strength of his campaign victories and his accomplishments in office, including passage of a tax overhaul this month. But he also expressed frustration and anger at Democrats, who he said refused to negotiate on anything, but he doesn't do anything. He doesn't do, Mr. Trump said. Hey, let's get together, let's do bipartisan. I say, good, let's go. Then you don't hear from him again. Nonetheless, Mr. Trump said he still hoped Democrats will work with him on bipartisan legislation in the coming year to overhaul health care improve the country's crumbling infrastructure and help young immigrants brought to the country as children. Mr. Trump disputed reports that suggested he does not have a detailed understanding of legislation, saying, I know the details of taxes better than anybody. Better than the greatest CPA I know the details of health care better than most, better than most. Later, he added that he knows more about the big bills debated in the Congress than any president that's ever been in office. The president also spoke at length about the special election this month in Alabama where Roy S. Moore, the Republican candidate, lost to a Democrat after being accused of sexual misconduct with young girls, including a minor, when he was in his 30s. Mr. Trump said that he supported Mr. Moore's opponent in the Republican primary race because he knew Mr. Moore would lose in the general election. And he insisted that he endorsed Mr. Moore later only because I feel that I have to endorse Republicans as the head of the party. Mr. Mueller's investigation appears to be moving ahead despite predictions by Mr. Trump's lawyers this year that it would be over by Thanksgiving. Mr. Trump said that he was not bothered by the fact that he does not know when it will be completed because he has nothing to hide.
Mr. Trump repeated his assertion that Democrats invented the Russia allegations as a hoax, as a ruse, as an excuse for losing an election. He said that everybody knows his associates did not collude with the Russians. Even as he insisted that the real stories are about Democrats who worked with Russians during the 2016 campaign. There's been no collusion. But I think as going to be fair, Mr. Trump said of Mr. Mueller. In recent weeks, Republican lawmakers have seized on anti-Trump texts sent by an FBI investigator who was removed from Mr. Mueller's team as evidence of political bias. At a hearing this month, Rep. Jim Jordan, Republican of Ohio, said that the public trust in this whole thing is gone. Although Mr. Trump said he believes Mr. Mueller will treat him fairly, Mr. Trump raised questions about how the special counsel had dealt with the lobbyist Tony Podesta. Mr. Podesta is the brother of Mrs. Clinton's campaign chairman, John D. Podesta, and Tony Podesta is under investigation for work his firm, the Podesta Group, did on behalf of a client referred to it in 2012 by Paul Manafort, the former Trump campaign chairman. Whatever happened to Podesta? Mr. Trump said. They closed their firm, they left in disgrace, the whole thing, and now you never heard of anything. Mr. Trump tried to put distance between himself and Mr. Manafort who was indicted in October. The president said that Mr. Manafort, whom he called very nice man and an honorable person had spent more time working for other candidates and presidents than for him. Paul only worked for me for a few months, Mr. Trump said. Paul worked for Ronald Reagan. His firm worked for John McCain, worked for Bob Dole, worked for many Republicans for far longer than he worked for me. And you're talking about what Paul was many years ago before I ever heard of him. He worked for me for what was it, three and a half months? Mr. Trump said it was too bad that Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, recused himself from overseeing the Russia investigation. Mr. Trump did not directly answer a question about whether he thought that Eric H. Holder Jr., President Barack Obama's first attorney general, was more loyal than Mr. Sessions had been. I don't want to get into loyalty, but I will tell you that, I will say this Holder protected President Obama. Totally protected him, Mr. Trump said. He added when you look at the things that they did, and Holder protected the president. And I have great respect for that, I'll be honest. Mr. Trump said he believes members of the news media will eventually cover him more favorably because they are profiting from the interest in his presidency and thus will want him re-elected. Another reason that I'm going to win another four years is because newspapers, television, all forms of media will tank if I'm not there because without me, their ratings are going down the tubes, Mr. Trump said, then invoked one of his preferred insults. Without me, the New York Times will indeed be not the failing New York Times but the failed New York Times. He added so they basically have to let me win. And eventually, probably six months before the election, they'll be loving me because they're saying, please, please, don't lose Donald Trump. Okay. After the interview, Mr. Trump walked out of the grill room, stopping briefly to speak to guests. He then showed off a plaque that listed the club's golf champions, including several years in which Mr. Trump had won its annual tournament. Asked how far he was hitting balls off the tee these days, Mr. Trump, who will turn 72 next year, was modest. Gets shorter every year, he said. Thank you for watching. For the follow-up, subscribe to the channel yourself here.